Welcome to Scuba Diver Live. Uh, we're back uh, with another live stream uh, it, that aims to inspire, educate, as well as bring a little bit of fun and laughter into your home in this very, very bizarre time with COVID-19. I um, hope everyone's staying sane, um, trying to stay positive. Just remember, we will all get back in the water at some point, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, if you like what we're doing, just remember, hit that subscribe button, ring the bell, and then you'll never miss another installment. Uh, that'd be great. And remember, leave us any comments, uh, let us know what you'd like to see in any future live streams, and we'll do our best to oblige. Um, before I bring in our new guests, um, I am just going to say a big thank you to the guys at, Sco at Kubi. Uh, Kubi Dry Gloves, they're one of the most popular dry glove setups on the market, undoubtedly. Um, you can get the factory fit options, but you can also get retro fit that you can put onto your own dry suit. Um, very easy to use. You see them everywhere. So big up to them for helping us out. If you get to... Uh, if you want warm hands when you're in cold water, check them out. Now, before we start, we've got a cluster of fantastic guests on today, uh, and they will be open for all your questions. So fire them in, and then once we've had a talk to them, we will be uh, putting your questions to them. Uh, so without further ado, we've got three leading lights from the world of scuba diving and YouTube. So we've got Sarah Richard from Girls at Scuba. We've got James Blackman from Divers Ready. And we've got Arjun Ligamod from 50 Foot Below. So welcome, guys. Hey, Mark, thanks Hi. for having us. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. <laughs> Great. Happy to be here. Right. How are you doing? I'll kick off first with a nice easy one for anyone watching so they can find out how you all got started. So not being feminist here, but ladies first. So, Sarah, how did you first get into diving? I first got into diving 11 years ago when I was 19, and I was on holiday in the Maldives. And... For anyone that's been to the Maldives, there's nothing else really to do other than relax and go scuba diving. So um, I saw a guy walking into the water going scuba diving. And I was like, that's what I want to do. And from that day forward, I knew that scuba diving had to be in my life forever. And it has been. So it was an instantly hooked experience. Absolutely. Yeah, because it was a lovely visibility, warm water, um, tropical amazing paradise and i thought that that's what scuba diving would be like forever you know it's not that beautiful all the time but it definitely that feeling's never gone so what is it about diving then that particularly captivated you i think it was kind of like the freedom of it all like feeling the gear when you first put on the gear and thinking like oh it's really really uncomfortable and a bit heavy and then you walk into the water and then suddenly it's like you leave like everything, all the weight goes off of your shoulders and you're kind of in your own world. You don't have to talk to people and everything that happens is kind of like what's happening in front of you and what's happening in your head. And I just, it's like a really like meditating experience for me. It makes me feel just incredible. Cool. Yeah, I totally get that. I still feel, even now, after all the years that I've been diving, um, even if I'm just jumping into some quarry for testing equipment, I just like that feeling of uh, weightlessness and, it's the nearest you can get to flying, is what I always say. Yeah, it's a very addictive feeling, very addictive. No one yeah. Definitely. Uh, Arjan, how about you? How did you first get into diving? Well, I wasn't hooked at first because my dad introduced us to diving in the Netherlands. And we actually did finish our open water during a uh, blizzard, so it was snowing. Uh, <laughs> so it was kind of hard. And eventually we went out to the... Um, uh, canary islands and that's where we did our first real tropic dive and we really loved it the the instructor was really nice and he showed us a lot and it was just wonderful to experience it for the first time as it has meant to be experienced and not in a, in a blizzard in a lake that is a seriously different approach to get into diving for the first time than sarah <laughs> in a blizzard was that like punishment from your father or was he just a little bit like you thought, well, it's character building? Yeah, I think the second, I did it with my little kid brother who was like five years younger than me. He was 12 at the time and we were in, in, in wetsuits and yeah, it was definitely character building. <laughs> wetsuits in a blizzard. Yeah, there you go. That's definitely, if you stuck with diving after being introduced with that, something's got to be right about it. Yeah, it was especially the dive in the Canary Islands. We, we visited the wreck, and the guy just made it so so fun to 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 do. And we saw all the fish, and we were just hooked after that dive. 
And so what was it for you? Obviously, like you said, there you're in warm water, you can see the fish and everything, which is great. But what was it about the feeling of diving and everything that did finally get you uh, properly hooked on it? Well, um, I like history a lot. And the fact that you can just or yeah, go into wrecks and, and, and see. I, I like to see a, a stair where somebody has walked or go into the, the captain's hut. It, it's just there's no limit in what you can see and do. And, and that's a, really a feeling of freedom for me. Yeah, get it. So, James, both of you, how did you first get into diving then? Hey, uh, sorry, I was just looking up the uh, Dutch number for Child Protective Services because uh, <laughs> I was going to report I and Dad. But uh, uh, I actually, if you think back, like your first memory that you can remember as a child, mine is actually scuba diving related, believe it or not. I don't know how old I was, but it was like I, I was I was small. I was a toddler or, or just above, and I had water wings on, and I was going into the shallow end of the pool to have a splash around, and scuba divers were using the deep end, and I remember – Obviously, adults are giants when you're that small and you're looking up at these guys and they were all clad in all this gear and they were jumping into like the deep end, which seemed super scary. So I have very faint, almost like through a fog memory of seeing scuba divers when I was learning to swim as a, as a very, very young child. So I don't know, you know, no qualifications in psychology, but that definitely planted a seed somewhere down the line. Um, and I got certified as soon as I could. As soon as I could, I did my open water with BSAC in in the uk um between southampton uh where i was at university and plymouth um basically up and down the south coast of england so yeah instant love it was never a, never a doubt it was going to play a big part in my life i didn't know it was going to play this big a part um but i always knew it was going to be a thing that uh, as soon as i was able to get into it i got into it so yeah Fantastic. So I like this, that we've got one person gets involved through proper warm water, like the dream approach to diving. One gets into it with, you know, UK diving a little bit, and the other one, it's basically the equivalent of torture. <laughs> but the fact that you're stupid <laughs> diving, Arjun, I think it uh, should be applauded. <laughs> yeah. So that was how you all got started. So then what was your next level into? When did it become either your full-time job or become a serious part of a secondary job for you? I'll throw that one out to Arjun first. Well, I was doing a, a study into tourism, which I quit because it was boring as hell. And <laughs> then I went to Bonaire in the Caribbean and did my dive master and instructor there. And they offered me a job to stay there for around a year. And then it became my actual job for a time. And... Um, Went back to Holland, got studying again, and did my internship at a diving operation, which we ended up taking over. Um, so I've, we've had a diving operation for 10 years, and that's actually when we started getting into YouTube as well. Okay, so you were in that way. So Sarah, how about you? Um, mine started about just after I finished my dive master in like 2014. Um, I applied to work as a dive master because at that time I definitely thought that was kind of the only way in to like working in diving to like earn some money in diving that was like way before I knew anything about like YouTube or content creating um, so I basically just applied for like every single job on like Paddy Pro uh, website and I got a job as a um, dive master in Micronesia and um, working on a liverboard which is like you know very extreme because uh, for a lot of people like truck lagoon micronesia is like the the dream destination I, I heard you say it actually mark the other day um on one of your lives that that's kind of like your dream destination um and at that time i didn't really know too much about it but it was an amazing experience however it was another story completely one of the reasons i sat with girls at scuba it wasn't a very nice job um and i kind of thought you know i don't really want to be in this industry anymore um, definitely not as like a dive master or instructor and that's kind of when I took a look at like other options and I saw a gap in the market for like female um, like empowerment female divers and stuff and went over to the content creation route. And that's your angle. Good, good. James, what about yourself? Uh, so pr a pretty standard story. I was a uh, uh recreational diver a hobbyist um till sort of my mid-20s um i spent my 20s working on ships and the nice thing about that lifestyle is you work seven days a week for four or six months at a time and then you have two or three months 
completely off. No phone calls, no emails at all. Um, so I would fill the gaps in between my contracts at sea with various different adventure sports. And before I got into scuba diving as a professional, I was a whitewater river guide and I did a lot of rafting and kayaking and that kind of stuff. So always had that kind of mind for adventure and kind of drifted away from that more towards doing scuba diving. Um, but it very much depended where I was in the world as to what I would fill my time between stints at sea. So one time I got off the ship in uh, in Indonesia. So I'm like, well, I'm a rescue diver. I might as well do my dive master. Uh, and then the next time I was in Costa Rica and I made the short hop over to Honduras to get my instructors. Um, and then, you know, it's very hard to have a relationship or or develop any kind of a personal life when you do this sort of, bye, honey, I'm off to work. I'll see you in six months um, kind of routine. So I, I decided, okay, well, we'll go for more of a land-based kind of lifestyle now and, and took the job as a general manager of a dive center in the Caribbean. And, you know, put my feet on land and rented an apartment for the first time in a long time. Um, so all those kind of features sort of led me into the path of making scuba diving my first sort of full-time living in terms of adventure sports. Um, but that got me into technical diving. Uh, and now here I am many years later owning Miami Technical Diving here in Miami, Florida and creating content for Divers Ready. Cool, cool. Well, very true. Sarah, I'm never talking to you again. I'd forgotten that you actually started in Truck Lagoon. I mean, that's just ridiculous. That. That's, like yeah. the, that's like the people when they do their try dive in the Maldives or something, or <laughs> on their first or second dive, and they see a whale shark. Yeah, yeah. Like that should just never happen. Before I saw a whale shark. Pardon? It took me like 7,000 dives yeah. to see a whale shark. And then you see some people see one on like dive four of their open water or something. So that you're the equivalent of that with Truck Lagoon. I know I am. Mark, 4,500 4, dives here, never seen one. Oh, at least, well, mate, you've got about another two and a half, 3,000 to go. Then you'll be all right. Still never seen one. Utila, Tanzania, Indonesia, Thailand. That I get in the water, the whale sharks go. Go to yeah, Mexico. I have, I have a whale shark, Jonah. Yeah. I have to say that. I am a whale shark journey. In all the time, the only one I saw was in very bad visibility off Tanzania, and it was literally a flash of spottiness that went by me. So I always thought there were just a giant spotty figment of people's imagination. Yeah, the Epic photographs you see in clear blue water with divers swimming next to them. Photoshop. It's all Photoshop. Yeah, Photoshop. You yeah. always go to Mexico. Like, you will see I've the errors. Add that to the list. Been there. I get in the water. They all go. Really? I, I, I am. Nine. I am whale shark. Nine. Nine. In one day. Yeah. In Mozambique. In around ten. I don't want to look at Yarion anymore. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. incredible. Well, that brought me on to the next thing. Was what was your most memorable diving moment? So I'll throw that one over to you, James. Let's chuck you on that one. Oof. I mean. I, anyone who's been in diving for a long time has sort of the, the dives that you think about once a week, right? That you go back to in your head or, or when you're sort of just daydreaming, you, you go back to a certain place. I mean, you know, to, to tag on to Sarah's, I mean, Truck Lagoon is is totally epic. Um, the first time I did Truck, I did Truck and Palau back to back. And that just, that is now the benchmark for me. I think, um, you know, I think of the San Francisco Maru engine room and I think of, uh, you know, blue point or german channel like once a week just think about that um in terms of epicness i think they're very very hard to beat yeah sounds good arjun what about you uh well i've been to south africa to cape town and it um um it's not really a dive because you're in a cage and you're more snorkeling but the uh, the visit with a with a great white shark is is just amazing it's the first time i got into the water and it came right at the cage it was a stunning sight. Yeah, that's definitely a memorable one. Sarah, what about you? Mine has to be Socorro in Mexico. Um, and we did a girls at scuba trip there in January. So we're really lucky that we got to do it before this happened. Um, but that was one of, I mean, the whole week was just amazing. But there was one dive where we literally um, rolled out the boat and we were greeted by a school of dolphins. And we descend down. And once we get down, there's... Um, there was three hammerheads just below us and a manta ray above. So in one shot, we managed to get um, dolphins, manta ray and hammerheads. It was mind blowing. I didn't even know dives like that could actually happen. It was incredible. You, you're definitely going down on my list at the moment. 
<laughs> I know. Um, so before we get into talking about your whole YouTube channels and how you got into that and everything, let's have one this last bit of uh, fun is what is your funniest diving moment when you've been in out there? Arjan, put that on to you first. Well, um, in Bonaire, we got a big wreck. It's called a Hilma Hooker, and it's quite deep. It's like 30 meters. It's not, it's okay, but some people get really um, nitrogen narcosis. So I always put them down in front of the wreck, and so I can look. And one guy was having it a little bit, and I have to put him beside me and keep an eye on him. And once we resurfaced, I was like, oh, what's the dive? And he said, ah, I did see Mary Poppins and a penguin. And so he was really knocked out even more than I expected. But it was so funny that on a wreck, he saw Mary Poppins walking on it. It was crazy. Well, I do remember that that ship, when they uh, impounded it, they found umpteen hundred kilograms of marijuana on it. So yeah. perhaps he was still just... Some of the after effects from that are maybe in the wreck, yeah. in the water around the wreck. Square oh. groupers. <laughs> Sarah, what about you? Um, I'm going to say one of the funniest moments when we were in Maldives last year and uh, we were doing these amazing drift dives. You get you get such great drift dives in the Maldives where you know you literally are like Superman and we're all doing like all different kind of like super poses um drifting along going on our back everything like this and there was one guy who was uh, just behind um underneath us and he went on his back to kind of like copy what we were doing do a little drift and like he couldn't see but there was just kind of like a big rock coming towards him we were going like pointing 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 and he went straight into the back of the rock with his tank and it could have been so much worse than it was like he didn't get hurt the tank didn't get hurt probably the worst thing that happened was if there was any corals or anything on that rock would have got ruined but it was so so funny because he was just showing off and he got what came to him <laughs> that's yeah diving karma i think that is <laughs> <laughs> james what about you what's your funniest moment i think for me um i was guiding a dive long story short shallow reef warm water beautiful visibility um sorry shallow wreck it was like a like maybe 15 meters deep um and we had this guy who was diving with us all week uh, who was just, he, he was a big American guy. He was bigger than me. He was probably like 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six. Uh, a real big sort of ex-military kind of guy. Um, you know, he gave the the impression of being tough. And he, he, sa he said he was here with his wife, but his wife like was nervous about diving. And we talked her into doing this dive because it was super easy. No current, great viz, warm water, nice and clear and all this kind of stuff. His wife shows up and she's tiny. She's like five foot nothing. A uh, lot of Mexican women, sweet as can be. And they get on the boat together. Of course, there's this you know huge side difference. I'm trying to balance this little single Mako boat. We go out and do the dive, and I'm guiding the dive. And he's one of those divers that's like been there, done that, done the deep, done the strong current, done the bad veers, done like just he's been there and done that. Well, we're on the wreck, and a, and a gray reef shark swims by a tiddler. I mean, like you know, meter and a half gray reef shark, something like that. And he loses it underwater, grabs hold of his wife by the tank and uses her as a shield, like as the shark swims by. So she's freaking out. He's just like lost it. I get them both back to the surface so safely and she proceeds to berate him and beat him up. And he's like, no, honey, I just wanted to make sure you saw it. That was his <laughs> excuse, but it wasn't that at all. <laughs> and it just, it just that, it was real slapstick comedy. It just, you know, poured a tear to my eye. <laughs> well, they always say that with that. Whenever you've got people saying, "Well, you can't, you, you're not going to be able to uh, outfin a shark," and you always just can say, "Well, I don't need to outfin the shark. I just need to outfin my buddy." Yeah, yeah. She she you was screaming a little bit further. She was screaming, "Ah, you were trying to feed me to it. You were trying to feed me to it." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like it. I like it. Right. Well, let's move on to what you're actually here for, other than having a bit of fun and finding out how you got into it and stuff. But um, what was it? that drew you towards YouTube, but videos in general as a medium to promote scuba diving. So throw that one out to Sarah first. Well, I kind of started um, when I was traveling and like doing my dive master and going towards working to a dive master. I was, was traveling by myself so as like a solo female traveler. And I decided to start doing um, travel videos so kind of not necessary to do with scuba diving but just about me traveling around and then I would always be scuba diving anyway so there would be like 
concepts of diving into it, but it would more be about like maybe the destination or something like that. So I kind of started doing it like that. And, and to begin with, it was really just to kind of like show friends and family and just to give more of an idea to people about like what I was doing when I was traveling to some of these destinations, like around South America and Central America, where maybe some people wouldn't think of going. So mine started super like organically like that. Um, and then when I started to notice a lot of people were really interested in, in the scuba diving side of it, you know, I would feature more scuba diving. But unlike the other two guys, like, I'm not completely scuba diving focused on my own personal channel. We have a Girls at Scuba channel as well, YouTube channel, which obviously is all to do with scuba diving. But my one is is more travel, but just with some scuba diving as well. So um, that was obviously – and so what was it that you thought that the – did you just think the video was better than you're doing like because obviously people started doing blogs and stuff like this the written blogs yeah. um but you obviously decided that you were doing it with the video bit what was the main reasoning for doing that i mean to be honest we do well I, i've done it with blogging i've still got my own blog and we've obviously got girls Cleaver website and stuff so it was really just testing what works best and to be honest like still writing still works really well it's just some people prefer video video is more kind of um I say like real time almost like for some people like don't have an attention span to like read a whole article whereas some people love just sitting down and reading some people love videos so it's not kind of like what's better what's worse it's just what we've done especially at Girls at Scuba is just tried everything and we just do everything and um, videos I personally love doing because I, I genuinely feel like I'm talking to people like even though I'm just talking to the camera and you just get a lot more responses and um, people feel like they know you better as well than just reading. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that's something that I've always thought is that um, you do get a bit more of a connection with video and you, the personality of the person you're watching comes across more than stills. Writing to an extent, you know, I try and put my character into the articles I write for the magazine, but I still think video is, is more immediate, as you said. So I totally get where you're coming from with that one. Arjan, how about you? What was it that drew you to YouTube and video? Well, we, we tried to, um, we had our diving operation and we noticed that video and video came more and more um, part of being a business. So we saw video reviews of electronic stores and stuff like that. But we wanted to do um, a video review of a certain BCD or regulator, but give an honest opinion because there are of course downsides to our certain product but what you, what we noticed was that uh, manufacturers don't really like that and if you uh, connect your name of your dive school on it they actually threaten you to not deliver any stuff anymore so we decided to take that part out since it was quite successful and start 50 feet below so we could be really independent and really give some value to the video because if you're just promoting a, a BC, yeah, they can do that themselves. So we really value the honest opinions we have about it. Yeah, because I was going to say, I've seen we, um, the stuff on 50 Foot Below where it was, you were trying to give like, you know, you, you were doing reviews, equipment reviews and everything, but then you were also doing some hints and advice stuff as well. So again, I think that that's where um, YouTube and a video can really work. Because when you're talking and demonstrating stuff, you can actually show what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. We we had the pool, of course, in in our older uh, facility, but yeah, we don't have to dive operation anymore. We're actually doing a round trip world with a sailboat, not right now because of the COVID nineteen, but we're we're getting back to that, and we're getting back to doing gear reviews and doing some tips and tricks, but. Yeah, that, that's mainly our, our thing, what we do. Okay. Good, good. James, what about uh, you? What was it that you made you want to become a YouTube sensation? Oh, Mark, I don't know <laughs> now. Uh, I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't, well, sensation's very generous. Thank you very much. I don't think that's, uh, that's fair, but I'll take it um, with gratitude. I think that our channel, like I said, is kind of a mix of lifestyle and product tips and, and hints and tips. But I did feel, um, like I and said, that there was a gap in the market for impartial advice. There's a lot of retailers out there, and either you're honest, like I and is, and it's like, okay, this is good for this reason, but bad for this reason, and the manufacturers aren't going to like that, 
or you have to be biased because you're trying to sell the product, which is inevitable uh, and, and fair enough. Um, so there was definitely sort of that gap out there for the impartial advice and also some lifestyle stuff. And, and really the inspiration for me came from the sort of photography, videography channels that were already very established on YouTube um, in, in that sort of format that mixes a little bit of lifestyle in there. And then also like, oh, and by the way, also look at this product and I've been using this and what do you think about it? Um, and I didn't really see too many people doing that blend with YouTube. Um, practically, how did we come to YouTube? It was it was by sheer mistake. I, um, my, my wife had to have major surgery last year on her back and we knew that she was going to be in for a, uh, a long recovery period and we'd be sort of housebound for a long time. Um, so I blocked a lot of time off from being a technical diving instructor. Uh, to to take care of her, but there's only so many reruns of Downton Abbey that I can sit through on the sofa before I start to get a little twitchy. Um, so we just I just started recording my thoughts and feelings about the dive industry on video and throwing them up on YouTube, and it started to get traction. So we we ran with it. Yeah, no, that is it's it, it is a different medium for doing it. Like you said, that there's everything you do from each one of you is a slightly different approach. Which is great because then if people are enjoying watching stuff onto YouTube, there's now getting a range of things out there that they can tune into to kind of say that desire, if you like. Um, but you all complement one another as well, which is great um, because I do find some of the other um, sports or activities out there that have got YouTube stuff, like my son, 13 and a half years old, watches more people playing computer games than he does playing computer games himself. Um, but a lot of them seem to be much of a muchness. They're all doing the same thing. They're all presented in the same way. And it just comes down to personality as to which one the kids link to. Um, but otherwise, there's no real difference. Whereas at least everything you're doing kind of complement one another, but they are very different, which is great. Now, I've got a question for you as well, which is a good one. Um, I get this from being in the magazine before we even started doing this live streaming stuff is where people will come and talk to me at a dive show or if I'm in a dive resort and they will come and start chatting away to me like we're best friends or we've known one another since school or something. I have no idea who they are, but they're using my first name and chatting away about me, but it's because they've been seeing me in the magazine every month and so they feel a bit connected. I'm sure you must get that even more so with people watching the videos as well as reading any of your blogs and stuff. So have you had any moments where that, where you've had anyone coming and just chatting away to you and you're like thinking, I have no idea who you are. <laughs> Arjun, put that one to you first. Well, um, back when we had the diving operation, yes, some people came and uh, I didn't know them and they know uh, me from their videos. But the last five months I've been on a boat through France in winter, so we didn't see anyone. So no, the last time, last couple of months, no, but before that yes sometimes <laughs> Sarah what about you yeah yeah I get it all the time but I mean you have to kind of remember that especially with such a huge platform like girls at scuba we've got nearly 700,000 across the whole network um so you kind of have to realize that these people are watching and you are allowing them to watch kind of some of your private life and stuff so so you kind of have to expect it, but it still really catches you off guard. Um, I think the funniest thing for me is because I've been doing like, you know, influencing and content creating for about five years now. So you get somewhat used to it. And if someone comes up and says your name and that or they'll be like, oh, how was Jordan or something like that? You know, you just talk back completely normally. But my boyfriend is not obviously used to it at all. And when we were at Go Diving Show, um, with you guys in February, he um, was sitting like as we was talking. The girls at Scuba Panel. Somebody came up and was like, "Oh, excuse me, sorry, I just want to double check. Are you Sarah Rich's boyfriend?" <laughs> and he was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> like, you know, he it's his favourite story. He like tells all of his friends. <laughs> he thinks it's amazing. <laughs> like, so yeah, but I, I love it. I think it's really nice. Um, and it actually, it's it's good because at least people are watching you as as a YouTuber or a content creator. No, it's good that you connect to it, which is which is what you want. What about you, James? Yeah, I didn't really expect it to happen, but it has has taken off. I think um, 
I think when you put yourself out there as a reviewer or a subject matter expert, um, you're inviting people to reach out and ask for your advice. Um, so I think you have, it, it's a privilege, but it's also a duty and a responsibility that you need to follow up on and when somebody asks you a question to, to take your time and give them an honest answer. So I get a ton of uh, questions through uh, Facebook Messenger, through the Divers Ready YouTube channel, through the comment section and and through our email. Uh, and I, I spend about an hour a day answering as many as I can, as honestly as I can. It could be questions about, you know, what course should I take? What agency should I train with? You know, backplate and wing versus jackets, LBTD. That's a very common one. All, all those kind of things, and and you got to you have a responsibility. If you put yourself out there, and it's it's the people that are following you and building your your brand, asking you these questions, then you, then you've got to take care of them. But in terms of like recognition, uh, you'll bear in mind it's what the fifteenth of May today. So in five days, we'll be divers ready one year anniversary. Um, we uploaded our first video the twentieth of May. So Dima show what November last year. Um, I have people coming up and asking for selfies with me. Uh, I don't know why I've got a face for radio, but they, there were people coming up and say, oh, we, can I get a photo with you? And my wife thought that was the funniest thing ever because it, it made me very uncomfortable for reasons I don't really know. Uh, but there were people like waiting for us to finish filming in a booth and they're like, can I, can I just get a photo with you, please? For, for, you know? And it was, it was funny because I'd, I'd blush and my wife would just lose it, <laughs> such as it is. <laughs> Oh, I like it. I like it. Um, so we've just lost Sarah for a minute, but while she's just re-logging in and coming back, I was just going to throw one more question to you before we invited some audience questions in. Um, obviously, you've all kind of got established in different ways, ended up on YouTube and stuff. So have you got any advice for anyone who's wanting to start out with a YouTube? Hey, Sarah's back. Hey, I'm in the countryside. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, so any advice for anyone wanting to get started in this field so that could be you know what you think works uh, for engaging with people but also a little bit about what equipment you got started on because uh, there's obviously lots of things you can do video on um but you know what do you find works so i'll chuck that one out to you uh arjan you can have that one first um i think equipment doesn't matter at all you can do it on a camera phone um we like doing uh, cinematic shots and making a real hassle of the b-roll but um if you just it's about the content and about what we do is an honest opinion if you can just get that across and um establish and try to think of what people might need um and what they run into when they buy a certain product um i, I think that's that that will get you on your way you're good james what about you um yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Arjen. He just uh, stole my answer. So now I'm like, um, no, I get it. <laughs> uh, I, I started with an iPhone. I started with an iPhone 10. Um, that was it. I didn't have an external microphone. I didn't have anything. I literally had a, a clamp, a desk clamp, and an iPhone. And that was that was all I recorded the whole of the first five or six videos on our channel on. And then I got a microphone and kind of, you know, you add to it. So my piece of advice for anyone to start is absolutely start. I talk to um, dive centers all the time that don't have a YouTube account at all. YouTube is the second biggest search engine and it's owned by the first biggest search engine, Google. So they share a back room algorithm. And if you're not being, if you're, if you're concerned for your Google uh, SEO rankings, you need to be concerned for your YouTube SEO rankings. If you have a presence on one, but not on the other, the maximum you can operate at is 50%. So just start. Um, and then when it comes to building your channel, um, yes, content is definitely important, but from a practical point of view, um, you have to be reliable and consistent with your uploads. It's no good to put it like videos up in, in a, in a patchy way. Um, if you can only do one video a month, great, do one video a month, but launch it on the same day at the same time every month and, and be strict with your schedule. Um, that both helps the YouTube algorithm, but it also helps you build a habit and once it becomes a habit to make videos think of the idea record it edit it and upload it once you've got that habit down it doesn't become a chore anymore and it, it will really help your business good sarah yeah for you so question just in case you missed it when you dropped out in the countryside was well, yeah it's just about any hints and advice for people who are getting started 
in doing a YouTube channel or their own videos and anything about like what kit you got started with, etc. Yeah, so I think um, what the guy said is, is completely true and that's what I would have said as well. Um, I started with an iPhone and to be honest, I haven't really upgraded too much since. Um, I mean, my style of videos are were never aimed to be like cinematic, um, kind of like beautiful videos that you would watch to maybe see like a little uh, macro like creature underwater. It was more about the actual lifestyle and the actual ad adventure of it all. So I, I definitely, I say this to people that have asked this question before as well, you don't have to be like a professional. You don't have to have all of the equipment. You just have to have like a good story and a good presence and a good personality um, for the videos, you know, you could actually be talking about anything, but it's kind of the way that you bring it across. It doesn't have, you know, don't have to go out and buy, spend 10 grand on gear before you've even launched your YouTube channel. Um, you really can start just with your phone. Another thing I'd say is, even if you're too scared to start at the moment, just, just register. Like, <coughs> get that name, especially if you have got a brand, for instance, with Girls at Scuba, you want to go and have that brand name on all channels. So even if you think, oh, maybe one day I want to start a YouTube channel, just to start it now, just get it, and then you can start learning. And YouTube itself is the place to go to get all of your hints and tips and everything if you are worried about equipment and stuff like that. But get it, get it ready. And I think Jane said, which is really true, this is the perfect time at the moment because you can do videos from home. You don't actually have to be scuba diving. No, exactly. Perfect time for people to get started, I think. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's good. Um, right, let's bring uh, Ross in, who's been beavering away in the background. Um, there's Ross. All right, Ross. Um, and let's have a few questions from uh, some of our viewers. So, so John's got a, an amazing question. Um, yeah, what, oh. what was the biggest dive that you've done and realised that you didn't have your camera on? <laughs> that's a pretty rookie mistake, I guess, but I'm sure you've either not had a memory card or, or something's failed. Uh, during one of these dives where you're trying to uh, capture, you know, a, a great piece of content. So, uh, James, you give us your, your story if you've got one. Um, no, not really. I mean, um, I've, I've flooded my fair share of GoPros, um, but not while filming anything that was particularly important. I mean, I, I take a GoPro with me on every dive because you never know. Uh, and I, I know it's controversial as an instructor, but I even do when I'm teaching uh, because I like to give video feedback to my students, particularly for tech when, you know, trim and buoyancy control becomes so, so vital. Um, so I do I do have a, a camera with me all, all the time. I have flooded my, you know, like I said, more than one GoPro, uh, but I don't think I've really ever lost any super important footage um, that I can think of. So. Don't really have a good example for that one. Sorry. <laughs> I, I am definitely guilty of this. Yeah. Uh, um, not checking memory cards. So it sounds like you have a story there, Sarah. Oh, like anyone that knows me personally would be surprised if I even remembered a camera, let alone. <laughs> I'm, I'm the worst. I'm just, I get so excited. I'm so excited for the dive that I'll like, you know, so I wouldn't even think about my camera. Um, but like, it, I'm sure it would be heartbreaking for you to hear, Mark, but I don't think I've filmed anything in Chuck Lugu. <laughs> I think <laughs> San Francisco Maroon, no, I haven't got any footage of it, um, which I think comes with part of the charm of the, the videos is, um, you know, right, yeah, today I'm going to go and dive one of the best reps in the world, you know, San Francisco Maroon, starting off with 55 metres, and then, oh, wait, there's no footage. <laughs> I, yeah, I do it a lot. Um, but, but again, I say I'm not a professional photographer or videographer. Um, and a lot of my videos, what I do is like the emotion, the excitement um, part of the diving. And I don't have um, like a professional underwater um, video uh, camera either. So the footage wouldn't maybe be as cinematic as people would hope. But that's why I think I found the niche in, in kind of the whole experience of the dive rather than just the underwater stuff. <laughs> sure. That's my excuse. Fair enough. Uh, uh, Arj, do, do, do you have any stories or we move on to the next question? Um, yeah, we just flooded a brand new camera last month. So <laughs> <laughs> that was no well, uh, we'll move questions then, shall we? <laughs> yeah, not, not a nice memory, that one. 
Now, now uh, I'm, I'm going to pick another question. I'm going to have to admit it's from me. Uh, <laughs> how do you pick your content that you create? <laughs> do you want to go with that one, Sarah? Um, yeah. So at Girls at Scuba, we have like proper content creation calendars and, you know, staff working on content. So it's um, quite scheduled over in Girls at Scuba, especially because it's a community and on our YouTube channel that is just launched, really. We um, are using it as a community YouTube channel, so it's not just going to be videos of me or any of the staff. It's just like all of the girls that are part of the community. So the great thing about that is that we can get content from like all over the world. And at the moment, we're working on like first dives back after like quarantine, after lockdown. And you know, with the community, we get to have the content from all over the world. So we we do like pick content for girls at Scuba when it comes to like my personal channel for the travel it was really just the experience of the travel so if I was going to Egypt for instance I would just film like the whole week um and then just put together one video so that wouldn't be so much like picking the content but of course I know I'm going to Egypt I know that I'm seeing the pyramids before I go on the liverboard so you kind yeah. of a little story in your head uh, yeah James, I understand you have like a, a list of a uh, hundred ideas that you want to do. I, I don't know if that list is still that long or if it's got uh, longer. It's gotten longer. The the bigger the channel grows, um, the more ideas I get because a lot of my ideas, uh, as Sarah was saying, are a viewer generated, viewer requested. Um, a lot of uh, equipment review requests. Can you review this BCD before I buy it? Well, yeah, you've got to bear in mind it takes me a long time to plan, source the materials, shoot the video, edit the video, and upload it so that you can decide whether or not to buy it or not. Um, so we do we do as many as we can, but that's obviously sort of one type of video. Um, but we also get a lot of requests for just general hints and tips, like which agency should we train with, or where should I do my IDC, or is this course worthwhile? So we try and get as many of those done that are, you know come through the sort of the channels. Um, but you're right, I have a I have a list of ideas. Um, some of those ideas are fully fledged out sort of scripts and, and B-roll sequences and all this kind of stuff. And some of them might even just be half a title. Um, so, that, but, but a lot of it comes, I think, in order deciding what content we're going to put out, which videos get made next in terms of priority, I research what's already out there on the subject. I don't want to make a video that 900 other people have already made and put out there because I'm not going to get any views from it or it's not going to sort of have as much impact as something that's sort of, you know, brand new. Um, case in point, that Russian rebreather helmet um, from, from yeah, Dima last wild. year. Yeah. That went crazy for us. Um, uh, but there were other videos out there where it didn't go so well because how many videos do you need to watch on a Russian rebreather helmet? Yeah. So, so <sighs> you, you don't look for um, videos that are trending and try and replicate them? No, I try and be the video that's trending by finding the hole in the market. Mm. Um, if, if, if there's already been 20 reviews of a BCD, what can I add to it? I mean, really, you know? Um, so I try and find things that are either new, different, or, or new to scuba diving. That could be the case yeah. as well. Arj, uh, is it a similar sort of process for you guys? Yeah, we're trying to get back to a, a bit more gear review because we are really gearheads and we, we like to do that. So we're in the works with the major brands to send us their newest gear and so we can test them. And we're actually a big fan of Behind the Mask. I don't know if any of you know them. <laughs> J James is frantically oh, yeah. nodding his head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> they're, they're awesome. And we're actually were in the works of doing a, a, a Rex of the Mediterranean kind of style video series but that has to be on hold because of the COVID-19 but yeah so so for, for the gear stuff uh, Arj at what point did you go to the manufacturers and start asking them for equipment um, actually two months ago because we had our own um, shop. own dive shop yeah. Yeah, yeah and we just got it from there now we don't own the dive shop anymore and we have to make um, arrangements that they send us our new gear but they're quite willing to do that, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. I should imagine once you get your your channel up and running, they they will send you stuff. Maybe not straight away, though. <laughs> no, not not straight away. Uh, what else have we got? Um, Sarah, uh, do you cover different 
topics between the blogs and vlogs or the same content, just different mediums? Yeah, we cover different topics because um, once you start getting into kind of like SEO, which is like search engine optimization, um, like James said before, like um, search engines like Google and YouTube, they are search engines, but you can't use the same content um, because the search engines will pick that up. So you need to really always be doing fresh, different content. So yeah, like what we write on the blog will be completely different from what we make a, a YouTube um, even the same with like Instagram and Facebook, we try not to use any of the same content. We might use it, but like a lot further down the line to kind of reuse some of the content. But um, I think, as I said before, we do find that we have different audiences on, on all these channels. Some people do prefer the videos and some people do prefer writing. So you have to keep that in mind um, and just keep creating new content all the time. Content is king. Like for all of this, for any like social media, YouTube, it's all about fresh new content. Yeah, de definitely. I, I think uh, Mark will agree. We, we use a lot of our content across all our different products. Um, can you give advice to, to the not so established YouTubers that are, that are really trying? You know, what, what's the one thing that you know now that you wish you knew sort of 12 months ago? Let's start with you, James. Um, like I said, my, my biggest piece of advice, and it, it is a common question that come, comes up, um, try and make content that is original. Don't, don't, I, would, I would advise anyone to not do uh, copy, what I call copy-paste content, where somebody's already made the video, you make your version of that video and put it out there. It, it just it, it doesn't resonate, and you're not going to get the views um, that you need to build the channel up and get your videos to start ranking on YouTube. Um, obviously, make sure you know your back end is optimized, your tags and, and your description and um, you know all your keywords and that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm a massive fan of uh, vidIQ as a, as a plugin tool to help get you know videos to rank for certain search terms. Um, so definitely recommend that. And then apart from that, it's just about the creator uh, being, like I said earlier, consistent. Be reliable, be consistent, uh, be true to your audience base um, and, and make sure that you're uploading like on a consistent schedule. That, that's my really my number one biggest piece of advice. Yeah, I, I, I think consistency is the key. Uh, I'm sure you would agree, Sarah. Yeah, I think that's definitely the, the best advice. I think a lot of people when first start in their channels are really focused on numbers. So they're like, how many views am I getting? How many people have said this? This, that. And that's the worst thing that you can focus on when you first start because you just start like beating yourself up. Um, you, especially with YouTube, you never really know when a video may just completely like hit. You know, for instance, if any of us have done a video about what to do as a scuba diver if there's a global pandemic, and if we did that five years ago, nothing would happen. But imagine if we'd done it and then a few months ago, that video then got yeah. millions and millions of hits. You know, it's the same with all of the kind of content that if you're writing content, you never, you can't think of it as in like, right, I'm going to post it and then tomorrow, oh, I've only got 100 views. It's not about what happens tomorrow. It's about that consistency. So keep putting that content up. I never expect it like overnight to get you loads of hits. You never know when it might become relevant. Yeah, I think it's important to, to note that um, YouTube certainly does not track in hours and minutes you know when you upload content it is months and years that, that you're looking at um yeah. uh, and that's certainly what what i have uh seen from looking at your channels uh, and other famous youtubers that, that my my son watches you know they might upload something and it will only get a, a few hits to start with but then all of a sudden once google starts picking it up it will it will go wild H how about you arj uh the biggest thing we've learned is that like the first 10 seconds are really important. You have to hook people in because if in those first 10 seconds, they don't see any value in your video, they just click it away and go on to the next one. Um, and also the thumbnail you use, um, what you promise in that thumbnail and title has to be affirmed in the first 10 seconds. That will help a lot. Cool, yeah, okay. Well, I'm gonna pass you back to Mark now because we are uh, quickly running out of time and uh, He's got one last question for everyone, and uh, 
I'll leave you with him. Good, good. Uh, yeah, so basically, just as last one, um, obviously we're in very, very bizarre times at the moment with the COVID-19 pandemic raging around the world. Um, so it was really, what does the future hold for your brands? Which obviously you might have lots and lots of stuff planned, which might have had to change a little bit now. But, uh, you know, what have you got coming up that you uh, you might be able to organise? Uh, I'll get on to James first. Okay. Um, yeah, um, I don't. I don't know that uh, that too much has changed from the YouTube side. Obviously, from the the teaching, the instruction side of Miami Technical Diving, everything is on hold from COVID nineteen. Um, but I've been able to stay on track with uploading, you know, our content on a regular weekly basis every Monday. Um, <laughs> shameless plug, but uh, I, I don't think too much has changed from that because, as Sarah said, you know, you can just be in your house and make scuba diving content and use you know, videos that you shot last summer on, on your vacation or whatever um, as, as B-roll or overlay. So not too much has changed from that point of view. Uh, I am, you know, still hoping that we get to do some travel this year. Um, me personally, you know, we had Bonaire and Curacao lined up for September, October back to back. As far as everything stands right now, those trips are still going ahead. Um, I did cancel our, our Great Lakes adventure, which was supposed to be next month. Um, but hopefully get to do some travel later this year. Obviously, we've got the um, Dream Dive Locker build out. The big reveal will be coming hopefully by the end of May, beginning of June, um, which is where we've taken our garage at our new house and turned it into YouTube studio slash dive locker storage facility slash classroom for Miami Technical Diving. So we've got that content coming. Um, and then, yeah, we'll hopefully with that facility and and making my workflow smoother where I have a dedicated space to make and edit videos. Um, we're going to try and ramp up to two videos a week. Uh, won't be an immediate change, but that's that's one of the goals for the channel is to gradually get up to posting two, twice a week. Cool, cool. Sarah, what about you? Well, yeah, I mean, we've had to change quite a lot because we had 12 international trips with Girls at Scuba Trips this year. So obviously a lot of those are not happening. Um, but that gives us a lot more time to concentrate on, on content. Um, we've got the great thing is that Girls at Scuba is a community, so it's not just me. There's all the girls that are involved in the community. So we're going to focus more on local diving and wherever that is local to, to the diver. And we can keep creating content endlessly on local diving because local diving to us, us that are in the UK is the UK, but if you're in Florida, it's, you know. So as destinations start to open up uh, when the regulations are that you can dive again we can continue to create content um, on all of those local destinations and um, we're also doing a lot of online courses so we're working with instructors within girls at scuba and we're doing zoom online courses like project aware paddy specialities because there are actually a lot of courses that you can do completely dry uh, and you can do online so yeah i think it's really exciting um, embracing the change and um, making a lot, lot more digital and a lot more content. Cool. Arjun, how about you? Well, we're on hold at the moment because our boat is still in Spain and our scuba gear is in it. And we don't like to um, get content what, which on which we were not really behind. Um, and also all the manufacturers don't send out gear now. So we're still on hold and hopefully the ban gets lifted and we can return to going around the world with our sailboat and discover undiscovered uh, diving upper and diving spots. And that's that's what we really want to do and test gear in the meanwhile. And, but to do that, this all has to be over first. Yeah, exactly. For us to get back on track. I think that's the same for everyone, unfortunately, at the moment. Yeah, everything's uh, on hold to an extent. So, you know, it's just one of those things. The sooner the better. That's what we want. So what I'll do is to let you finish off, because James kind of tagged it and said about a shameless plug when he mentioned these Mouthpiece Monday that he does. So I'll let each one of you can do a shameless plug to round out by promoting your own channels and let everyone know where they can find you. So, Sarah, you can go first. So you can find me personally at Coffee Then Travel on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and then you can find all of us girls over at Girls at Scuba on every single oh, every single platform, social media. We've got it all. So Girls at Scuba and Coffee Then Travel. Cool, cool. 
Arjun, where where can everyone find out what you're up to? We're mainly on uh, on on YouTube. You can find us at Fifty Feet Below YouTube dot com slash fifty feet below. Um, at the moment, there are not too many videos bring coming out, but we'll certainly be back very soon. So don't forget to subscribe and like. Cool, awesome, James. Over to you. Yeah, I can be found across to all the channels: Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube uh, at Divers Ready. Uh, we post a new video every Monday at six thirty Eastern time in the AM. Uh, hints and tips videos and just general scuba diver advice. So thanks very much to everyone on the chats as well. I see a lot of questions in there that uh, a lot of a lot of familiar names. So I want to say thank you to everyone who followed us over here. Cool, cool. Right. Well, thank you very much. I think pretty much that's all we've about got time for because we're nearly coming up to the hour. Um, so I'd just like to say a massive thank you to Arjun, Sarah and James for joining us on the virtual sofa. Uh, it was great having you guys here. Um, and uh, I'm sure we need to do it again post-coronavirus, when we can extol the virtues of all the cool stuff that we've been able to get up to. Thanks, Mark. Awesome. Thanks, for Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate Thank it. So, final shout-out for Kubi Dry Gloves. Um, their online store's open, um, so if you're wanting to get yourself some nice warm dry gloves to keep you warm and toasty in the cold waters when we can finally get back in and dive, you can look them up on the line below. And um, really, just a final thing to say is a date for your diary. The next Scuba Diver Live show will be next Tuesday, the 19th of May. Uh, we're going to be talking to Luke Inman and Lanny Vogel uh, about their varied diving careers and the attractions of Mexico as an overall diving destination, because one of them is on the East Coast and one is over on the West Coast. So tune in for that one. It'll be 8 p.m. BST. Uh, other than that, like I said, if you like what you see, hit that subscribe button, ring that bell so you know when the next installment is coming out. Uh, and like I said, leave us some uh, comments, let us know what you'd like to see, and we'll see what we can do. Thank you very much. See you soon.